Good morning, DrupalCon. Welcome to day three. How's everybody doing? You have a good night last night? I am so grateful to have you all here in my home city. I feel like I'm like hosting everyone, all old friends and new who have come to Portland, and it's wonderful to have you here. I'm glad the weather has finally decided to cooperate. It's going to be beautiful today and tomorrow especially and into Friday. So um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for coming. Day three of DrupalCon or Contribution Day is always my favorite day. I think this is one of the most community-oriented days of the event. It's a great time to uh, not only meet new people, get involved in new ways, advance the project, but also to develop your personal and professional skills. I think working with other folks in the community, beginning to start your first contributions levels you up, and then coming around and mentoring other people in their contributions takes you to that next level further. So I'm super excited about what we're talking about today, super excited to have you all here uh, and to get going. Um, we've launched a lot of things at DrupalCon this year, um, and we're going to be talking about a variety of Drupal initiatives, so it's my pleasure to begin introducing today's keynote. Um, obviously, as I said, it's contribution day. Here's a snapshot of some of that information. I want to uh, actually shout out the Drupal Association engineering team, my team. Some of you might have noticed, if you're really early risers, that um, there was actually a uh, security update for GitLab this morning. Um, so by the way, if you have your own personal instances, maybe check that out. But um, we got that all up to date and ready to go for everybody who's contributing today. So um, if you see a DA team member, say thank you. Um, we're getting this all squared away. Um, during DrupalCon, you will, uh, during contribution day, you'll probably be working on issues in the Drupal issue queue. We just want to remind you to tag those Portland 2024. That helps us track the impact of the event on the contribution space, and it's just a nice piece of etiquette so we can see everything that happened here at DrupalCon during the contribution time. Now, you were probably, if you're like me or anyone I've spoken to, incredibly inspired by the Drupal Starshot presentation in the Dries note on Monday and in the BOF conversations that have happened since then. I think it's an incredible opportunity for the community to come together. So when you're in the contribution space, especially the general contribution room, bring those stickers out that have your sort of pledges or the things you want to work on and maybe connect with some like-minded people to establish a, a table to work on uh, some of those things to help move Starshot forward. Um, Last year, you may remember, if you joined us in Pittsburgh or if you followed up after the event, that we um, launched a special initiative, a sort of contribution contest uh, called Pitchburg. And we selected six projects that with the help of a variety of sponsors, we funded to do uh, new and innovative ideas in Drupal. And we're really thrilled to give you an update on all of those projects, all six of which have completed their original scope. So I'd like to invite Alex Moreno, Mr. Pitchberg from the Drupal Association team to give you a quick update on these projects. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, everyone. Alex, Mr. Pitchberg Moreno to report that all projects have completed successfully. I'm going to introduce each one of the projects and I'm going to let their project list to give a final update. The first one is uh, Brian Perry, who is the lead of the Drupal API client. Their goal was to combine the best of existing Drupal API clients into a set of utilities that can both address common use cases with little configuration. Let's watch his update. Hey, DrupalCon. Excited to share what the Drupal API client has accomplished. We've completed our commitment for Pitchburg, which has resulted in the 1.0 release of our JSON API client, which you can install on NPM right now. We've also published three supporting packages as well. And definitely want to thank all who contributed, especially our two new maintainers, Kobe and Pratik. We've also published detailed documentation on GitLab pages, um, including things like live code examples um, and a detailed tutorial where you can see things like, uh, you know, how we built out a grid of recipes, there's also examples of how you can use this client to fetch data in different frameworks like React or Svelte or meta frameworks like Next.js or even within a progressively decoupled Drupal site itself. 
And we also have a full API reference published within the docs as well. We've also created an issue on the ideas queue, proposing that these packages be promoted under the Drupal namespace on NPM. If you agree, uh, definitely drop in and provide your support. We're working on our 1.x roadmap. One thing we want to focus on is TypeScript improvements and automatic type generation, but we definitely want to hear from you uh, what you'd like to see us do next. All of this information is provided on our project page, um, which is API underscore client. We're super excited to have completed this phase of the project, but ideally this is just the beginning of what we're trying to accomplish. So we really want to hear from the community how you're using these packages or what you'd like to see them do in the future. But right now I got to get going because I think another JavaScript framework just dropped. <laughs>
completely removing it, we're allowing you to turn it off. Um, but this is just to show how powerful the Access Policy API is because it's actually quite simple to turn that off, that behavior of user one. If we look at the merge request, we created this parameter on the container that you set in your services file. And if you set that to true, then your site still behaves like it should. Um, but if you set that to false, then user one no longer has an all access pass. And all we need to do for that is in a compiler pass, we check for that parameter and then we remove the access policy service from the container. That's it. As soon as we do that, user one has no more special permissions. It's that simple. It's also that simple to add your policies to the container. Um, as shown in the documentation, you just create a service and you declare it. And from now on, all permissions will be calculated, including your access policy and all permission checks will obviously then check those permissions, including the one the ones coming from your access policy or the ones that you removed in your access policy. It's really powerful. It's really cool what we can do with it. And it's completely part of core now. So enjoy. Let's continue with Amy Jun. She's the lead of the Mentor the Mentor. And the goal was to rebuild the assets for a first time contributor workshop to be more interactive instead of a straight content delivery and provide documentation and turnkey presentations that anyone can use their local at their local events. Let's hear the update. Amy June Heinlein here, Volkswagen Chick on Drupal.org to give you an update on the Mentor the Mentor project. The Drupal Core Mentoring First Time Contributor Workshop has undergone some transformation. Flagship event workshops have been rebuilt to empower mentors and less seasoned speakers outside of the core group um, to help facilitate the workshop. It's now user-friendly and adaptable to many audiences, including regional, local, and virtual camps. Scripting and knowledge-based documentation accompany a now plug-and-play slide deck where you can hide slides for a more effective presentation. At Florida Drupal Camp, Ultimike, Mike Anello, did a fantastic job customizing the workshop for that 45 to one minute time requirement. The workshop ran smooth by effectively hiding slides and reserving demos for the contribution room. I was sitting there making real time um, improvements as feedback came in. And then the session was delivered at several events after Florida. Drupal South um, was led by Sushi Garg, Matthew Radcliffe gave it at Midcamp, and then Sean during Drupal Camp New Jersey's contribution day. I'm continually working on documentation improvements to ensure a more seamless experience for future events and mentors. The second part of my pitch was creating a presentation around issue queue etiquette for organizations. Now, we folded that into the same workshop. We include the do's and don'ts around adding files, re-rolling patches, creating merge requests, what are appropriate first tasks for beginners, and then, of course, those guidelines for moving past novice issues. Now, organizations can use that same slide deck when they talk about the do's and don'ts when they're onboarding their new contributors. Our community has been reworking the issue queue etiquette over this past year, so this will remain a work in progress. Member mentored contribution is later in the week, and I'm real excited to have this first time contributor workshop be more accessible, easier to deliver for first time mentors and for less seasoned speakers. Now, remember, our goal in open source is to sustain continued contributions, not just that first time contribution. And mentoring is one of the best ways we can do that. Come visit the booth or come to any of the boffs this week to learn how you can mentor the next wave of our new contributors. Thank you very much. JSON acceleration goal was to implement JSON data storage. The update is from Brad Jones. Thank you to the Drupal Association and their generous donors for sponsoring my work on JSON document storage and schema generation this year. Because of this investment and the votes of DrupalCon attendees to support this initiative, we now boast a best-in-class support for JSON document storage within the entity and field APIs. I encourage you to explore the possibilities this unlocks for your projects. In the future, this foundation could even form the basis for a more flexible field storage system overall. There is also discussion in the layout builder queue about using JSON data storage going forward. Drupal Core can now produce entity schemas in tandem with format specific contributed modules such as OpenAPI. This is already very useful for API consumers 
But think of the future possibilities when these schemas are paired with the new official API client. Thanks again, and enjoy your DrupalCon. And finally, and last but not least, Gutenberg in Drupal have been working to streamline the implementation of core Gutenberg library in Drupal to allow more frequent and easy updates. Let's hear the update from Thor at Frontcom. Hi DrupalCon, this is Thor from Frontcom. The Drupal Gutenberg editor has been improved, starting with a workshop gathering both Drupal and the WordPress communities. We reached our goals and achieved more than we even hoped for, even with high expectations. Now, four wins and results from the Pitchburg work. We created a Gutenberg starter theme for quick testing and uh, theming reference. You can test it right now using the Gitpod link on the project page. Secondly, we have enhanced the core Gutenberg library integration for more frequent and easier updates. We're improving the developer experience quite a bit by creating a system where Drupal plugins generate custom Gutenberg blocks, helping themers without React experience. And number four, a big update will come in the Drupal Gutenberg 4.0 major release. We'll introduce a layout builder replacement with even more features You'll get single field editing for any text field using Gutenberg as the only editor on the site. And finally, entity agnostic abilities. Using Gutenberg, not only with nodes, but taxonomies, products, groups, web forms, or custom entities. Pitchburg was a great accelerator for our strategic initiative to help Drupal become the most easy to use enterprise CMS. I said that the six projects have finished, but actually that's part of the story. Um, most of them are working beyond the scope of their initial goals. Pittsburgh have proved to be a you know, huge success. Uh, it has helped us to come as a community and prove that we can make amazing things together. And this is just the beginning. Starshot is next. And we can, we can use a lot of the lessons uh, from Pittsburgh. There are no limits for the Drupal rocket, not even the sky. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pitchberg. So, shortly here, we will be bringing up the next generation of initiative updates. Um, and in order to do that, it's, very, it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Bianchi of Acquia, who will be introducing our speakers today. Digital expectations are always evolving. You have to break through the noise because every sea change starts with a single drop. Acquia knows how to navigate a shifting digital landscape and shape a digital future that is safe, accessible, and open. Acquia's Open DXP promotes portability, customization, and integration, and champions freedom, participation, and inclusion by empowering businesses and enriching lives through elevated digital experiences. Because when you have the freedom to create, the future is yours to shape. Thank you, thank you. I'm a little taller than Alex. Um, good morning, everyone. Great to be here. It's, of course, contribution day, as you've uh, already heard a couple of people say. And so I thought I'd see if you were all awake and ready to go a little bit this morning. Uh, I wanted to sell, uh, spend a minute celebrating actually some of our top contributors. So if you are indeed awake, what I'd love for your help with is as I call out some of the top individual contributors to Drupal over the past year to give them a really big round of applause and maybe some cheers. Does that sound okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. So here are some of the top five contributors uh, individual contributors to Drupal so far. I'm going to go usernames for brevity, so hopefully you know these people. First up, Catch. <laughs> Smustgrave. <laughs> Longwave. <laughs> Laurie. <laughs> and Quiet One. And then, last but not least, all of you. Yay! 
So one of the reasons that I wanted to call out the top contributors today is, of course, we've got this uh, great project in front of us, the, the Drupal Starshot Initiative. Uh, and so I hope as you go into Contribution Day, you're thinking about all of the things that you can do to contribute to that project overall. And I wanted to actually reaffirm my pledge here on the stage this morning. So uh, many of you know that uh, I lead product marketing at Acquia, and uh, uh, my pledge is to use my skills. I want to help spread the word about Drupal at every single speaking opportunity that I've got this year, all of the conferences around the world, and hopefully we can get more people involved in Drupal. So uh, I'll be in Barcelona in just a few months' time. I can't wait to hear all of the updates around Starshot. But today uh, and this session is all about some of the great initiatives that have been going on. So without further ado, please could you put your hands together for the Drupal Initiative leads. Welcome, everybody. I love this turnout for Contribution Day. Welcome. Yay. So this is the Drupal Initiative Leads keynote. I'm Gabor Hoichi from Dark Mode with Starlight Accents. <laughs> and um, I'm really, I'm really uh, happy for this format because I think this brings forward all of these great people that are leading these super important initiatives. And I'm really thrilled that DrupalCon here puts this on the morning of Contribution Day because after we are done here, you can sit with all of these people in the Contribution Room and in the Mentored Room and get stuff done and learn how they work and be involved in the future of Drupal and also learn a lot for yourself and improve yourself in Drupal. So I think that's really powerful. And for this year, uh, I kind of took uh, Dries's message from the last Dries note of letting a thousand flowers bloom. And I thought about uh, including contrib innovations as well, because you know you use Drupal with a lot of contrib, and that's your experience of Drupal, and we should embrace a lot more of that as well, not just the core initiatives. A lot of things start in contrib and then become core, or now Starshot. Um, and so we will cover some of those things that are coming up, and we'll set up new ecosystems, and some of the things that support existing ecosystems as well. So we have a lot of topics for today. And first up is Amber, and she will talk about issue queue initiatives that help all of your contributions go through smoothly with the Drupal project. Let's give it up for Amber. Today I want to tell you about initiatives that are helping people uh, contribute in a strategic way. And as a result, increasing throughput in the core issue queue. Throughput is the rate that a project's issues are resolved and committed, and it's one way to gauge the health of an open source project like Drupal. Throughput is an interesting thing to look at because it shows how engaged and responsive maintainers and contributors are in the issue queue. When throughput is high, it increases momentum, builds confidence and positive morale, and can even help attract and retain contributors. When people are excited and encouraged to contribute and they have a good experience collaborating with others in the community, this keeps the project moving forward and getting better. When issues are getting fixed and committed on a steady basis, this is a good indication that committers are getting the support they need from contributors. Let me tell you about a few things that the Drupal Association is doing to encourage meaningful contribution. These include changes to the new user welcome email, contribution credit, and the credit bounty program. And I want to highlight a recent change to the Drupal certified partner program. The new version of the welcome to Drupal email now includes a link to a landing page that has links to contribution resources. Since the first step to contributing to Drupal is signing up for a drupal.org user account, this small change is important because it encourages contribution from the very beginning. When you contribute to an issue, you can say whether you're working on your own or sponsored by an organization or even a customer. When the issue gets fixed, the committer selects the people who made helpful contributions and they get credit. This is a way to reward and encourage meaningful contribution. 
This credit gets listed on your Drupal.org user profile, which helps you build your reputation. Organizations who sponsor time on contribution and those on issues that get fixed, they get a boost in the marketplace, which helps them build and maintain their reputation. You may be nodding your head, yes, yes, I want to earn credit, build my reputation, and give back to the project, but I don't know where to start or where to focus my efforts. Your time is limited and valuable, so how can you contribute in a strategic way, in a meaningful way? The Credit Bounty Program was created to help people who are interested in contributing and want to know where to focus and maximize their efforts. The program is described in detail in a couple of association blog posts, which I have linked to in this Drupalize.me blog post in the QR code. Five issues were chosen as targets. When you make a meaningful contribution on any of these issues, your credit is multiplied by five. These are sticky, hard problems, and they're getting the attention they need because of this bounty program. And contributors are getting extra credit for working on them. One of the recent enhancements to the Drupal Certified Partner Program is the annual contribution credit requirement. We know that sponsored contribution is vital to the health of an open source project, and this change will help sustain and support experts who want to contribute to Drupal. So those are some ways that the DA is encouraging contribution, and you'll also be hearing about initiatives focused on new and improved features in Drupal. But there are two community initiatives that are being strategic in the way they work in the core issue queue, bug smash and needs review queue initiatives. The Bug Smash Initiative is a community initiative started in May 2020 working on known bugs in Drupal core. Many of these bugs are quite old. Bug Smashers have reduced the total number of years of all open bugs significantly since its formation through triage and actual work fixing bugs. In the Bug Smash channel, people can ask and answer questions, triage issues, and work on what we're calling the one the oldest open bug in the core issue queue. Our comment templates and docs help bug smashers engage with others in the issue queue and move issues toward resolution. Bug smashers do daily triage and meet once a month to check in on goals and progress. Since bug smash has started, there are about 2,000 fewer core bugs. Over 1,000 bugs have been fixed and over 4,000 bugs smashed. The Needs Review Q initiative has increased core commit activity and engagement on issues by helping ensure that an issue is ready for a committer's review. The group focuses on two main problems, issues that aren't getting timely reviews and issues that need work because they don't meet established standards. People in this initiative keep an eye on the needs review queue and strive to give timely reviews. This has kept the queue to under 150 issues. The needs review queue bot runs limited testing on issues with the needs review status and updates the status to needs work if the code isn't mergeable. I'll be at a table today in the general contribution room and I'll be happy to tell you more about bug smash or needs review queue initiatives and I can help you find issues that those groups are working on right now. Mentors, if you have questions about these, please feel free to find me or ping me on Slack at Amber Mats. As you look for an issue to work on today, use the tags of these initiatives. This will help you align your contribution with a group effort and make it more likely that the issue will get fixed. Working with a group can be motivating and fun. Your contributions can help you and Drupal grow and thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. I really like the, how these different things combine, like the way the DA onboards new contributors and then the community takes them over and shepherds their issues through the queue. I think it's wonderful. It's amazing to see. Um, so, But this improves the performance of getting through the issue queue, but let's see how we improve the performance of Drupal itself with maybe a, an initiative that kind of goes under the radar, I think, and many of you may not know. So let's give it up to Yanis to talk about that.
Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce you to Gender, the new performance testing framework that uh, we created for Core. It revolutionizes the way we do performance testing and it puts Drupal on the forefront of the innovation once again. 15 years ago, uh, our performance topic maintainer, Nathaniel Catchpole Catch, created an issue to add automated performance testing to Core. And after more than a decade, we finally have it. And <laughs> Nat led the effort, which is also great. Um, before introducing Gander, uh, performance testing was done mostly manually and uh, only rarely. Um, done by people that are already overworked, that require attention uh, in other areas. Um, we didn't have any standardized tests, which led to inconsistent results, um, which often meant that issues were detected too late, um, often when they hit live website, which is not great. Um, automated performance testing will be a long-term investment. It will take some time to see the real results, but it puts us in a better position long-term. So imagine developing Drupal without automated tests at this point. This is something similar. Um, and it should also improve our performance-oriented culture, uh, which, in which, like every developer when working on a feature or reviewing somebody other's code, should think about performance as well. Um, we should start adding tests to fixes that get into core uh, to make sure that issues do not get in unnoticed and this will lead to faster Drupal. Uh, Gander was born out of collaboration between uh, Google Chrome team and Tag1. Google Chrome team has a goal to make the internet a faster place and they are working with open source communities with open source platforms to achieve that. So they teamed up with Tag1 to do that. And we are not alone. WordPress is doing something similar, and we are constantly in, communica in communication with one of their core developers, Adam Silverstein, uh, to share ideas, to share experiences, and to learn from each other. Um, Gander is already available. It uh, became part of Drupal Core with 10.2 release, which means that you can start using it already. We are currently mostly using it in Core, but uh, we're not limited to that. Uh, contributed modules, even custom projects can start using it and reaping its benefits now. Um, it currently collects the following performance metrics. Um, some of them are more backend oriented, some of them are more front end oriented, which gives us a nice holistic view of performance of a site. We would like to add more metrics to this list, and this is definitely one of the areas uh, where we, could, we would love to see contributions. Um, Gander can be used in two ways, which are complementary and not mutually exclusive. First, more straightforward one, is what we call performance assertions. Uh, it basically extends uh, existing JavaScript tests um, and lets us collect performance metrics while the test is navigating the test site. And then when the test is done, we can assert on those metrics that were collected. Uh, this ensures that you know, new performance regressions that were already fixed are not sneaking back in and the performance stays in the range that we expect it to. Um, we can also use it in a different, more complicated way, which is to run tests regularly, collect the data, and send it to a dashboard, where we can then display long-term trends to spot any anomalies uh, that might sneak in. And we are already doing this for core, and we are hosting a dashboard for core. Gander already helped us in identify and fix a few issues, and most significant one resulted in a 10% faster uh, core test suite runs uh, across the board, which um, saves a lot of time for people and also a lot of compute time. And just by doing that, Gander basically already paid for itself. But this is not the only improvement. We are also, we identified uh, things that can be improved in logging procedure, in session handling, and so on. We have a blog post about that, so if you're interested in all of those, please check that out. If you want to start using Gander today, um, we have a documentation page on Drupal Wiki, which is where the left side of the screen will lead you to, and it will help you get started. And on the right side of the screen, you will get to a page where we are publishing updates and news about Gander. And speaking about getting started, 
the easiest way to do so is to use the DDEV add-on that we've created, which will get you from zero to a completely working local environment in a matter of minutes and 10 shell commands, I think. So definitely check that out. Um, we are looking for contributors and adopters, first and foremost among the core developers community, but not just that, we would like to see contributed modules uh, start using it and also custom projects. Um, and if you are willing and trying to do so, please reach out and we can help. If you wanna learn more about Gander, I gave an in-depth talk yesterday, um, so you definitely want to check that out. If you weren't at the talk, uh, and since Time Machine was not invented yet, the second best option is to check the recording when it gets out. <laughs> so let's start performance testing today, and let's make Drupal the fastest, pl fastest platform on the web. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Yanis. How many of you uh, Gander is news for? How many of you learn about Gander now? All right, half of the room, nice. So that's great, I think it's great. Um, next up is another um, thing that supports our infrastructure, supports our ecosystem of modules so that everybody can be, everybody can have better quality Drupal and that's gonna be Fran about our GitLab CI system. Hi everyone, in the last DrupalCon at Lille, I had the chance to talk about GitLab CI focus on Drupal core. This time, I get the chance of talking about it for Contrib. There's been a lot going on in the last few months, and hopefully you will see some of that progress in the next slides. But first, and I would like a bit of history, GitLab CI will replace Drupal CI, which has been the testing platform for core and Contrib for many years. The system worked, but it was difficult to extend, it required high maintenance. Despite all that, the project was still used by thousands of modules, so we need to fill those shoes. And GitLab CI was first made as experimental to some of the module maintainers that decided to opt in. Thanks to their help, we created some base templates, we refined them, and then we released those templates to all countries. Adding those templates to your module now could not be easier. You can see that it's just a bunch of lines. You just need to add that predefined template to the root of your module, and you're done. That's it. You don't need to do anything else. You don't need to do that through an issue, merge request. Once a module is using GitLab CI, you will see how when you visit the project page, you can see the pipeline results next to the dev release branches, or when you are working on an issue and you create a merge request, you can also see the result of those pip pipelines. If you just click on those icons, you will be taken to the GitLab page where you will see something like what we are about to see. Out of the box, the pipeline will create a Drupal project, enable your module, run Composer on it, run multiple validation checks, and run the test suite of your module. Again, all without writing a single line of code. Isn't that amazing? Our first goal when we were developing the templates was to get feature parity with Drupal core. And if you compare this slide with the previous, the format might look slightly different, but the jobs that are being run, all these uh, validation checks, all this testing, it's the same, minus the emojis. We didn't get there. Um, but now, Contrib, as we saw before, there are so many Contrib modules, there are thousands out there. So doing just what Core did was great, but Contrib needs much more. Each module has different needs, and we offer a lot of really great choices, which you are about to see. The first of them is that you can actually skip jobs. Maybe not all modules need to have all those validation checks. Maybe you don't want to have CSPL or PHP unit or PHP stand, so you can just set one of those variables to one and the job will be skipped, you can forget about it. Now, what about the opposite of skipping? We can also opt in to some variants which allow us to test like, the 
previous and the next Drupal version. So if you want to check if your module is ready for Drupal 11 or if it's still compatible with Drupal 9, you just need to set those variables to one and you will get them running on the pipeline. Again, one line of code. As the number of options started to grow, we also realized that we needed to write some documentation pages and <clears throat> we decided to keep on leveraging uh, GitLab. So we use GitLab pages to be the documentation site. And we also offer several artifacts that will help maintainers, uh, like a PHP stand baseline or maybe CSP configuration file. You can just download them, place them in, the, in your module, and you're done. Um, I mentioned GitLab pages, and that's because you can also generate documentation for your contrib modules. You just need to place a few markdown files in a certain folder, and we will be the documentation site for you. We use exactly the same job to build our documentation site, so we're eating our own dog food too. But the great thing of GitLab is that it offers full flexibility. You might want to run tests in parallel. You can do it. You might want to run several database or PHP versions. You can easily do it. And you can create brand new jobs as your module needs. You are not limited by anything. I know, I know. Drupal 7. <laughs> okay, hopefully not many of you are thinking about it. But if you are and you have contrib modules, you can still use GitLab CI. The templates are fully compatible with Drupal 7. The options are not as comprehensive as for Drupal 10. But you can still do everything that you could do with Drupal CI. I think all the previews really show us that we have a very powerful system in Contrib now as well. The adoption has been great, and it has offered module maintainers a great tool to improve their code, to improve the testing, and to keep on moving onwards and upwards. This also means that we are in a very good position to fully deprecate um, Drupal CI. We've been turning off a few features over the last few months, and we will eventually fully deprecate it and turn it off. But I think we are in great hands now. Are we done yet? Um, not really. If you go and visit uh, the page of the project, uh, and you go and visit the issue queue, you can see that we have feature requests, that we have bugs, that we have documentation issues, and you can work in any of that. We really appreciate any contributor's help because you will be helping everybody in the community. We normally hang out in the GitLab Slack channel, but as Gabor mentioned, I will be in the contribution room, so come and fetch me. I don't want to finish without thanking everybody to help, that helped. It was a big combined effort by the Drupal Association and so many members of the community. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fran. I, th I think it's great. Um, we already work with Fran on getting the ecosystem, get on tools to get the ecosystem ready for an easier upgrade path to Drupal 12 with the GitLab CI, so it's amazing, the possibilities that are there. Uh, but next up is Ted Bowman, and he's gonna talk about automatic updates and the things that you can build on top of automatic updates. Super exciting, I think. So I didn't know I'd be after Fran, but I'd just like to take a second to say, with the GitLab CI, we can do stuff with automatic updates that we could have never done. It's making our core process a lot easier. On all our tests, we run our own tests on the contrib module. We run a conversion to turn it into what will be the core merge pull request, and then we run our tests also as they will be in core, which we definitely could not have done with, uh, with the old system. So, thanks. Uh, so I'm here to talk about what's happened in the automatic updates initiative in the contrib module since Pittsburgh. Um, and I'm also here to talk a little bit about experimentation that hopefully we can do today in the contrib space. And uh, basically to use our API and to see what the future of the automatic updates initiative could be. Um, and so here are some of the recent contributors. Adam and Travis have been helping me on the client side, XJM, uh, Alex and Catch have been helping with core reviews. Tim, Neil, and Chris, ha Christopher have been really helping with the Drupal.org infrastructure side needed. And Peter and David Strauss have been really helping with a lot of good security feedback. So in Pittsburgh, we had an Alpha 1 module released, and we were just getting user testing. Um, we're basically sort of begging people to use it, you know, saying, yes, we, we know it's Alpha, but we, you know, and we know it's automatic updates, but really, could you? you know, be our first guinea pigs. And now we have a stable version since December. 
We now have unattended updates, which is really the feature that everybody's wanted, updates while you sleep. Um, you can configure it for all patch updates or security updates, and you can run it via regular Drupal cron, or you can run it with a Symfony console command that we shipped to make it even more secure. And we also have now contrib updates, and this is actually in a sub-module because this is not in the core NBP path for core, um, but this may be in core at some point. Um, but you just turn on the sub-module. The only thing we don't support is unattended updates for modules and themes because those usually should be tested manually. We also had a security review of the contrib module completed. This was sponsored by the Drupal Association and done by Core53, a, a security, outside security form. And you know we didn't find anything big. Uh, we have made some public issues for security hardening, but I hope that, you know, I feel more confident you know, with our work after a couple of years having somebody outside look at it. Um, we have about 300 sites and it's been a sort of steadily moving up. And since I think it's been a year since we had a user reported bug, um, we've had no user reported bugs with the, since the stable release of three. Um, so we really want you to use it today. I will be around if you need help. Um, and in the auto updates Slack channel, you can ping me or anybody else. Um, and really want to get, I think the best way to get it into core is basically test what now will hopefully be very close to the core code. Um, so today I want to run some experiments. So underneath automatic updates, there's a module called package manager, which is sort of basically a composer utility module. This supports automatic updates and project browsers module installs, but it also could support basically anything that you could think of as a composer problem that you want to handle. Um, so for that purpose, for, I have made a new module called Automatic Update Extras, and this will build on the API of Package Manager and Automatic Updates, and it might add features that aren't in the core NVP. Maybe we'll never live in core, or maybe we'll find they're so important that they should be in core. Um, I have some ideas, but also you can scratch your own itch. A lot of problem, one of the big things people always ask is if there's gonna be Git integration. So that's not gonna be in Drupal core, but this could easily be in, in automatic updates extras. We provide uh, events in Package Manager that you can easily um, listen to. In this example, we listened for basically a pre-update event. We check to see if it's an automatic update stage, and then we check the Git status, and then we add an error if the git status is not clean. Simply adding an error here will stop any package manager operation you don't, and send the message to the UI. And then on post apply, in this case, we check again if it's automatic updates, we ask the system where the project root is, and then we make a git commit. Obviously that was what you would do today. <laughs> um, another thing that people all often ask for is how backups could work. So this is a very simple idea of how you might be able to do backup and migrate integrations. Um, we listen to the pre-apply event, and we'd probably listen to post-apply if you want to put a backup before and after the update. So we simply listen to the Avidian, check to see if it's automatic updates, we uh, get the uh, backup and migrate service and then commit it. Another idea is a dependency installer. You may have noticed that if you install something like Webform that has sub-modules, even if you install it correctly via Composer, its sub-modules might not have all their Composer dependencies. So an ex idea would be to simply provide an install dependencies link, and then you would implement something that extends stage-based, which comes from Package Manager. And you could think of stages as basically Composer operators. And in this case, we basically get all of the dependencies for the module, and we provide utilities to translate between Drupal projects and Composer packages. And then we inspect the, um, to see what is the difference between active and stage and install the ones we don't have. I made a bunch of starter issues for these ideas and others. So if you wanna to come to the contribution room, uh, have ideas of pointing towards the package manager API and automatic updates to see like parallel code for the things that you might want to do to give you sort of pointers. Um, but also you could do advanced experiments that I haven't thought of yet, basically looking at composer um, package conflicts on updates, you could run PHP stand code inspection between the stage and the active site to make sure there's not an undetected break that you can't detect generally just from Composer. 
Um, if you have any questions, please come to the Automatic Updates Slack after the event or right now. Um, you can file issues in the Automatics Contrib project. So if you have ideas for other future experiments or you're just having trouble or you want to help installing a module, please let us know. Um, I hope to see you in the contribution room. You would think, you would think that automatic updates is done and then you, you, that, then it's over, but, you, but there's always these questions of these advanced use cases and now they are possible to implement. So now is your time to get involved in them as well. Uh, so this was our most technical talk for today. So we'll turn to more of the user interfaces, I guess, and the, all, the con uh, all of our technology around them. Uh, so next up is Jürgen Hess. And when I asked him to come here, um, he said, yeah, well, I can make it. So he came all the way here from Germany for the six minutes and 20 seconds. Um, uh, but I think it's worth it. So let's give it up for Jürgen. Hey, I'm so excited to talk about ECA today to all of you. So what is it? ECA is the tool which allows the ambitious site builder to build automations on their Drupal sites without writing a single line of code. But the next statement may catch you by surprise. ECA is a black box and brings no UI whatsoever, right? So it's a processor. It processes as a black box all your pre-configured automations in the background. Um, and it focuses on performance, stability, and granular functionality. So, hey, where do all those diagrams come from that we see every time we talk about ECA, right? They come from one of those modelers, as we call them. So there is a choice of user interface, each of which is developed and maintained in individual and separate modules so that subject expert, uh, experts can actually maintain them and build what's good for the user experience, and they know how to do that. Now, do you really need ECA on your site? Yes, I think so. It should be everywhere, because it is not only to build a strategic solution for something. It is there for the simple task, the complex one, up to even complex uh, applications, if you like. So let's dive into them one by one. For example, notifications. You want to know if there is a new comment on your site, if there is a note published, if there is a workflow state change, or if a new user signs up to your site. Why not sending out an email on that, right? Now, there are modules for that, but ECA does it all at once, and the user experience is the same for everyone. Well, let me know. Is there a single Drupal site without a custom module that's only there because you need to alter a form? I haven't seen one. Now you can do that in ECA, and the side benefit to that is you also get the documentation that shows you what's going on, why, and who did it, and how it looks like, so it's self-documenting. Adding a call to action to any of your landing pages just because it happens to be important overnight, you can do that in ECA with two clicks, and you can even implement the endpoint that responds to the click if a user actually takes the act, uh, call to action. Who doesn't want to know uh, to, to alter the authorization flow, like redirect the user to an appropriate page after they logged in, depending upon their user role, or many other things. But we can get even more complex, like let's talk about the editorial workflow. Like, for example, you would like to forward a uh, moderation state to another one depending on some of your business rules. You can do that with ECA as well. And again, you get readable documentation. People who understand BPMN, they do understand what's going on here as well. But what happens if you have to process large data sets? Like, for example, uh, uh, publishing a note um, needs to send out hundreds, if not thousands, of emails. You don't want your editor waiting in front of the browser until all those emails have been sent out, so just stick them in a queue and make sure that cron is actually taking that up and sending it out later. We have even built ourselves full applications with ECA, but I don't tell you about them because I spoke to so many folks here on DrupalCon, and I'm amazed what other people have built with it. It is just outstanding. It's just unbelievable. 
So ECI as a module or as an ecosystem, I should call it, because there are so many modules, is growing nicely. But what's most important to me is the fact that we only come with one single dependency, and that's Drupal Core. Why is that important? Because that's the only way how we can guarantee that we maintain it moving forward. Uh, and why that's important to me, uh, remember my pledge that I made earlier this week, um, I need to make sure it really works along the way. And how can you get started? Well, my recommendation is go to ecaguide.org. That's a website that contain, contains all the documentation and all the links to all the other sources where you get help. Uh, but I want to highlight the Slack channel on Drupal, uh, the ECA channel on Drupal Slack, because there are all the great folks helping you if you have questions. Where do, you go, where do we go from here? Well, ECA 2 is coming, uh, and it supports 10.3 and 11. It's only a few weeks away. And if I talk about we, well, that's not just the five maintainers. There are already more than 60 people helping us every day, and without them, ECA wouldn't be what it is today. So thanks to them, it's a great help and it's a great motivator for us as, as well. But still, we need more help. And not necessarily in coding. It's more about uh, providing content, uh, transferring knowledge, and so on and so forth. So let's have a look what that all looks about. As I mentioned, there is the ECA guide, so there is an infrastructure which is already pretty great. But I'm really looking for somebody who wants to take on, for example, the role of collecting content, structuring that properly, making sure it's always up to date, and so on and so forth. But if that's not in your realm, then that's okay. Just writing a page of documentation is great too. But of course, providing code is something that we very much like as well. And you can also integrate your own modules into ECA so that all the users who want to automate can leverage your module as well. So, I hope I brought the message across that really ECA is for every Drupal site. It's a mature suite of uh, modules and it's ready for prime time. So, as it wouldn't be what it is without the people behind it, I want to invite you to become part of that ride. It's really fun and I want to see you helping us. Let's work together for an exciting Drupal. Thank you. Thank you. I think when we say Drupal is low code, this is uh, this as far as you can get, right? You click together what you want, then it works. Um, so I, I'd like to ask Jay at the back uh, to remove our timer because we will go over, but I promise you that it will be worth it. So we just don't want to look at our time anymore because we will know that we'll go over now. Um, the next up is uh, Christina Chumilas, and she is going to talk about the front end of the back end is the way I like to think about it. So I think Drupal really deserves to look beautiful and she's putting in a lot of work to do that. Let's give it up. Bon dia, Portland, which actually means good morning in Catalan, which is the language that we speak in Barcelona. And I hope you all come in September. You don't want to miss it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the new navigation that we just got into core. Um, I was able to work on that for six months, uh, sponsored by Lulabot, uh, and it was great, and it's been, it's been like a long road. It's been more than a year that we've been working on that, and wow, it's been a long trip. But we are finally in core. Um, the, we are experimental as beta uh, since just like one week or just a little bit more than that. And as you can see, we've introduced this new vertical, collapsible um, new navigation that can hold the huge uh, information ar architecture that actually Drupal needs. And why have we done that? We basically wanted to introduce modern and up-to-date patterns uh, into the admin uh, interface in Drupal. And we basically needed to move a puzzle of pieces and the new navigation, well, the top toolbar needed to move to the left. And it was the first piece of this puzzle. 
we actually started doing um, and uh, implementing and creating a, a niche HTML prototype, and we put that into Drupal, and we started testing that. And when we found the best way of uh, working and creating this prototype, we actually integrated it with uh, real menus. And uh, well, we actually did a lot of tests during all this time. We tested before, we, we did some research before, we tested during the design system, we tested during the development, and all of this uh, knowledge that we gather actually inform a lot of the decisions that we've taken over time. For example, the need to customize a lot of this new navigation because people needed an excuse to actually uh, jump into the new navigation. So we are uh, able now uh, from the first day to customize uh, existing menus, to create new menus, to change the logo or make it bigger because you know it's important. And uh, we also are reusing parts of uh, Drupal core. Uh, people don't want to have to learn from scratch things. We are using menus, we are using blocks, so uh, people don't have to learn things uh, from uh, zero uh, when we st uh, start working on that. We are also reusing Layout Builder. You can see on the URL why we ended up uh, using Layout Builder. So if you enable the new navigation, you will be able to drag and drop um, the menus that you want on the on the navigation, you will be able to add new blocks, and it's going to be a dependency from the new navigation. And we've actually one of the things that I'm more proud of is the how we actually changed from the beginning uh, to what we have right now. We have a drawer to actually open uh, the submenus. Uh, it increased the usability from the first things that we thought were going to be best. And we implemented a strategy, a strategy that it's called Safe Triangle that makes it easier. We are actually implementing a new design system that is using modern strategies like uh, a layer of tokenization, different tokens that will help replace uh, the colors that we use, dark mode, anyone, these kind of things. So it's going to be a new thing. So, and it's not just like that. We've actually introduced an experimental module inside the experimental module. Uh, basically, that is uh, adding this new piece. We have the left one. We have now the top one. And we are going to start using this top one for contextual things uh, that are going to be related to the page itself. This is, this is an idea of where the direction that we're actually taking. Uh, we will have to test all that. As you can see, the safe on top on there is going to be controversial. We want to test everything before uh, sh uh, shipping any, th any stuff, any new stuff. And for example, one of the new things that is going to, this is going to bring is for, uh, removing the local actions from the front end theme and moving it at the top. We can add a lot of more information and we want to make sure that we introduce a way, an easy way, for country modules and custom modules to improve the admin interface. We've actually, and I'm really also proud of that, we don't have jQuery on the new navigation, which is really good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and um, we are also using modern CSS. We plan to move everything to SDC, and we're actually, we already started that. So yeah, we're uh, also doing, uh, we're taking really seriously accessibility. We have this uh, issue that you can see in here. We are enforcing uh, uh, to follow all the accessibility uh, gates that we have in Drupal core. And we already have a lot of uh, work. So if you want to help us, please come to the sprints and start testing. We also want to give the possibility for, for people to uh, choose their own icon. So if you have an idea, uh, help us, uh, because it will be a great uh, contribution. We also uh, talk with the people from the admin toolbar, and we would love to have a search integrated in the navigation and SDCs. Um, as I was saying, uh, the we want to have SDC uh, as one of the things that we want to do. And also current priorities are getting into stable and Nightwatch tests. So if you know how to write Nightwatch tests, please help us and we will be able to uh, get things done. And I know it's a huge list, uh, but I don't want to miss anybody. Uh, so that's really important. There's been a lot of people helping out with this initiative, and that wouldn't be possible with people that came from nothing, nowhere, and said, hey, I want to help, and they actually were key 
to actually get the uh, navigation done. So come get involved. Uh, right now we are in core. You can find the issue queue uh, of uh, filtering by navigation module. Uh, if we have ideas of integration that could go into the navigation or the top bar, come and tell us. Uh, come to the Slack, the admin UI, or into the sprints, uh, the admin UI table, tables. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. It's great. So this is all already in 10.3, so you can try it out in 10.3 when that comes out, or already in the dev version. Uh, so that was the front end of the back end. And so now, let's go to Matteo, and he's going to talk to us about the back end of the front end, which is SDC. And this kind of took the, the front end world by storm in Drupal, and I think it re reinvigorated us to um, have a fresh look. So let's give it up to Matteo. Bon dia. <laughs> I'm Matteo, and my passion lives in this magic place that exists between the front end and the back end. And to that effect, I created single directory components, which is a standardized way to use UI components in our Drupal projects. This was done thanks to Lullabot, which sponsored my time, and it's the company that I own. <clears throat> one year ago, I was standing in a similar stage to this one in Pittsburgh, and I was talking about single directory components and how I thought which our next steps should be for the initiative, and now's the future, and we're gonna talk about it. Uh, we grew the components channel. Uh, this has translated in a buzzing activity and a shared space to discuss the best practices to build component-driven websites. And uh, we've also seen this new modules and themes emerge around components, and we started putting components in, in core. Uh, this was me alone. Jennifer helped writing documentation and maintaining it. Pablo helped me with reviews and encouragement to make SDC stable, and Ivan actually started putting components inside of the Drupal core themes, like Umami and Olivero. And let me tell you about Pierre. Uh, he is the person I go to with my theories, my visions, my goals around components, because he's very experienced building these design system implementations in Drupal. His passion is to make theming a site building activity. And he was instrumental in making sure that SDC was ready from prime time. He also helps coordinate the UI suite initiative, which is a set of modules with 20 something developers behind it, and they are active since 2022, and their goal is to expose components to site builders through a set of plugins. They're, in their own word, they want to make the front-end developer the owner of the design system implementation that then they can pass to the back-end developer or the site builder to connect the Drupal data. They used to have their own component implementation, but moving forward, they will start using SDC, and this is important because they have a lot of design system implementations, like Bootstrap, Material, Zurb Foundation, the French government, and the US federal government design systems. So they will all be SDC now. <laughs> we also rewrote the Storybook module because one, we wanted to simplify the setup and maintenance of the Storybook application, and two, because we wanted to start using Twig to write our stories so we can leverage the dynamic features of like function calls, loops, et cetera. Uh, however, as you surely remember from last year, one of the goals is to expose non-developers to putting components in the page. And oftentimes, we have done this through Twig with very simple mapping. So why don't we do this with the UI? There are reasons to do that, and it's not only because we want to empower the ambitious site builder in a hairdresser site, but also because development agencies will see a lot of boring and repetitive front-end work evaporate along with dozens and dozens of specially named tweak templates. And as DC display is 
one of the modules that will allow this, uh, which will connect the components with view modes for entities. In here, I'm choosing a card component. And after that, I will connect the header of the card with the title of the recipe. And then I go to the body, and I select the field difficulty and the media image to print it. And then I save. And that's how you can render components in entities. But you can also use SDC display to render individual fields with components or multiple fields using field groups in components. But we don't stop there. SDC block also turns components into blocks. And in here, I'm selecting a CTA component. And once I select it, a configuration form pops up, which I can use then tokens to use no dependent configuration. And once I save it, the component is on the page. And notice how I didn't have to write a block plugin or a configuration form because it's auto-derived from the component schema. I didn't have to write a tweak template to embed it to the page. So you can start using SDC block and SDC display today, but in the future, we will be using Experience Builder. In a nutshell, Experience Builder is a simplified way to build your pages and templates by dragging components uh, into the admin interface. And we are getting started on, on Experience Builder. And we have a lot of question marks. But we know what we're building. Uh, this, this is inspired because of all of the research that Drupal's product manager, Larry Scola, did, and we know that we're going there, and we have seen competitor products like this one go very far, but as I said, we know what we're building, and we have our secret weapon, which is a structured data, which will enable us to build content at scale, which is something that they cannot even dream about. And that's that. Uh, if you're passionate about this, which you should be, come to the sprint room, Find me, find Mike, or find Jennifer, and uh, we'll find tasks for you. We have tasks for front-end developers, back-end developers, pro project managers, for technical writers. That's it. Ta-da. I told you it's, it's going to be worth it, right? So, today's the day when all of us, every single one of us, will be around in the, room, in the contribution rooms and you'll be able to work with us on this very bright, bright future for Drupal. And we have four tracks for today. So the first track is the first time contribution workshop where you can learn about the tools and know how to get started using these tools. So that's gonna be next door behind that wall. So be there. If you already know the tools and you want to get hands-on mentoring and going through specific issues in the Drupal queue, then the mentored contribution is for you. It's going to be below us at B113, 114. And the new thing today is marketing contribution. Yeah. So after this talk and the, and the break, is going to be a panel that's introducing you this new brand that you might have noticed. This is the first main stage session with a new brand. It's cool, right? I think it's cool. Uh, so there's going to be a panel, and that's followed by a dedicated room for marketing contribution. It's not only for marketers. We would like to have all kinds of contribution content writers. We need to have first timers to review what we are writing so it makes sense, etc. So all kinds of people that uh, can help there, you're welcome. And finally, everybody else will be in the general contribution room, which has a map there when you arrive with a map of the table so you can find where SDC is, where automatic updates is, where ECA is, and you can get involved with all of these fantastic things today. So enjoy your day today and see you around. Thank you.